And that's yet another DDG win. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Dead War Gaming YouTube channel. Um, we are three days out now from the Peoria Regional Championships in Illinois. Um, so that means we've got another Team DDG podcast for you to go over the meta and what we're expecting for uh, this week's tournament. Um, with me, we got a bunch of returning guests and one new player. Um, we'll go around the horn. Uh, our one of the best seniors players in the world, we got Owen Dalgard. Um, and then two of the best masters players in the world, Gabe Smart and Andrew Hedrick. Um, and finally, our brand new uh masters player as of last week, uh, Michael Davidson has joined the 23 2024 roster. So, let's start with you, Michael. How, how are things been going? How's it, uh, How's it feel to be on the DG roster? Uh, it feels really good. And this week I've been farming my locals. So I guess maybe it's bringing me some good luck as well. Yeah, you had a you had a good weekend with the, uh, was it one or two cup wins? Just, just one cup just win, one. but I okay. won uh, a challenge the same week. That's right. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, yep, we got Michael on the roster now. Um, I think we're up to like 13 players when I last counted. So um we have grown fast in in just eight months now so uh anyways like i said we got peoria regionals coming up um huge uh kind of change in the meta expected with the release of scarlet violet 151 um we'll mention also that uh michael is coming off a 12th place finish in the first regional of the year the pittsburgh regional championships so uh his input here is going to be valuable as we head into uh the second biggest or second tournament of the year um but i want to kick it off just starting uh with what is going to be most impactful from the newest set that came out a couple weeks ago scarlet and violet 151 uh came out uh, I think it was almost exactly two weeks ago now. Um, and we had Mew EX come out of that set. Uh, some a few supporter cards, few item cards. Um, but I wanted to start off maybe either with, with Gabe or Andrew. What do you all think are the best cards out of the set? And which decks are going to be most influenced by those cards? Um. I mean, I think like the obvious one is Mew EX. Obviously, many people have been adding that to different decks. I think a little bit later, we're going to get to like what decks we think that card's actually supposed to be in. But it's obviously a very strong card. And I, like the main deck it's made like actually viable, I think, is Colorless Lugia. That was before. Didn't have a way to like deal a big amount of damage very easily. With, besides with Weirder, which used a bunch of energy. So it wasn't always great. But now Mew EX definitely makes the deck better. I'm still not entirely sure how good it is. I've been testing it. I'm, I, I still don't even know exactly how good it is, but it definitely becomes playable with Mew EX. So I think that's a big change in the meta that we could see. Yeah, so I, I think the obvious answer is definitely Mew EX, but uh, the 70 HP Charmander, I think, is um, pretty relevant. Um, it helps out Charizard quite a bit um, because now they can't Sableye and knock out two Charmanders at once without using something like Halucha, which is um, significantly harder to pull off. Um, the call for family Pidgeys are right, but I think the 60 HP one's a little bit better, but I know that's been, you know, kind of a discussion that's been getting talked about whether or not the 60 or 50 HP one is better. Um, but other than that, there's not a whole lot from the new set. I know that some people have talked about supporters like, um, Giovanni's charisma and then the new, um, Erica's card, but I don't think that those will see too much play just because they're supporters. And, um, I, you know, the fact that you can't really draw many cards with them or anything like that, I think is going to hinder their playability. Um, but I would say aside from UEX, probably the biggest one would be the 70 HP um, Charmander. That, that, and then like Cycling Road's okay, but I think that probably those um, two ones being UEX and then the Charmander would be the, I guess, most talked about new cards you should look into. Michael, what are your, what are your thoughts on? Um, yeah, I, I mostly agree. Uh, I don't think there's any like big new archetypes coming on, but I th I think obviously Lugia... Uh, in particular, it gets a big, uh, well, single strike more than, uh, or sorry, colorless more than single strike, but colorless Lugia definitely uh, improves a decent amount with that Mew EX. And I also think that the 70 HP uh, will Charmander will make a big difference in Zard because previously like Lost Fox or any deck that with Sableye has been like kind of a tough matchup. Obviously, obviously Giratina is still a tough matchup, but Lost Fox is definitely going to be slightly more towards 
uh, more winnable for Zard with that 70 HP charm. Owen, oh, any closing thoughts? Any, uh, yeah, uh, one of the cards that I didn't hear you guys mention was Zapdos EX, uh, which has been like a really good card in uh, J Japan for Maridon. Uh, it was in the champion list of like a 3,000 player event for the Champions League. And I've been playing it in Maridon. It's like some people think it shouldn't be in Maridon. It's a really hard play to pull off. It's 120 to the active and uh, I believe 90 to the bench, but it has to be damaged. So you have to hit like this crazy Halucha play and hope they don't have mana fee. But I think it's really interesting, and it could add some, like, extra, crazy, like, turn one, turn two plays for Maridon. Yeah, it, it you're facing a man on the board though. It's much more difficult to take care of that than with Lost Zone. So, it's a difficult play to pull off. Uh, I want to stick with with the discussion on Lugia just real quick. So, um, Andrew came off a top four finish with Lugia in Pittsburgh. Um, we joked last last time if uh, Gabe had how much uh, blame and or uh, contribution he had to that decision. But um, do you all think you know, y'all been playing Lugia for quite a while? Obviously, Andrew won back to back regionals with it um, last season. Is colorless Lugia now a better deck than the single strike version or which which one comes out on top in that discussion? Um, so I guess one thing I would say is your matchups with Colorless Lugia, I actually don't like as much, but one of the big things that improves with the deck is your matchup against uh, Charizard EX gets a lot better. Um, I even think like it could be 50-50 or even maybe favored. I still like have to play it a little bit more, but it, it feels a lot better. Um, Mew EX means that if you can force your opponent to one prize at the end of the game, you can always close with uh, copying their Charizard's attack for 330 to knock them out. You can also... If you get behind on prizes, Luxury, Reversal, Energy, Boss, Pidgeot for two prizes. And also you can just go a one prize up route with Snorlaxes if you know you attack with your Lugia early when they can't one shot it and then go into one prizes and kind of trade with them from there. So you have a lot of different routes in that matchup. And you can it definitely feels a lot better than single strike where you know you don't really have as many one prizes or one shot options on there two prize Pokemon. So and it seems like it's a little bit more cons consistent since you're not having to deal with only being able to attach single strike energy to certain Pokemon or, you know, yeah. having to... And that means that you have, like, a little bit less issues running out of energy as well, which was an issue single strike. Like, you had, like, you know, sometimes you would run out of Colorless Energy and you couldn't attack or something, or you could get stuck and active with bosses' orders, but Colorless Lugia really doesn't have that issue as much. The only time yeah. it really can come up is if you attack with a weird ear, which uses a bunch of energy. But plus, well, for boss style, at least, you have four copies of Jet. That so is true as well. Way less. Like and then the, the other thing... Um, I know something this that me and Andrew liked about Colorless Lugia is that if you just get an energy onto Snorlax turn one, even if you don't think you can get double Archaeops turn two, if you can find one of your, what, four DTEs, two energies on Snorlax, you'll still be attacking for pretty meaningful damage, even with the Archaeops. And you could even just attach two double turbo energies to Lugia as well if you open that. Like, So you have, you have a couple options to attack turn two without using uh, Summoning Star. Yeah, I would honestly say that um, it kind of depends on what decks you're trying to beat, because I do think that single strike admittedly takes a couple better matchups against certain things. Like I think it's Maradon matchup is slightly better. I think it's honestly, I think it's lost box matchups might be like a little bit stronger simply because you have a better response to things like um, Dragonite with things like Tyranitar. Stonjourner is incredibly powerful versus Raikou uh, V. However, um, pretty much what Andrew said, I do think that the Charizard matchup is significantly better for Colorless. And I also would say the Gardevoir matchup is better um, just because Temple of Sinnoh doesn't affect Colorless as much because Drapion can still hit through um, with the Temple of Sinnoh because the Drapion only takes four Carless energy, whereas things like Evil Tall and like Tyranitar, you have to have like the single strike energies actually. So I would say it really just depends on what decks you're trying to beat and what you expect, because I do think that both variants have um, positive qualities of um, both. So I would say, in my opinion, I think that consistency is always king. And I think that the Carlos variant is a little bit more consistent. Um, but I wouldn't say that the single strike version is bad. I know that a lot of people, um, like on social media and stuff like that, have been um, saying, "Oh, like the Carlos version is like significantly better." I wouldn't say it's significantly better. It really just depends on what the meta game is going to be like. Because maybe, um, 
everyone is prepared for Carlos Lugia and the metagame kind of shifts and then something like single strike, you know, runs through like all the Garatinas and lost boxes and um, like Maridons and stuff like that. Um, that's always something to look at. But I think that single strike is better than what people are giving it credit for. It just kind of depends on what matchups you're trying to like f- focus on beating. So yeah, I, was I, think, say- I think the most significant matchup differences are I think your Maridon matchup is a lot worse with Colorless Lugia and yeah, your yeah, matchup is a lot worse with single strike. So I think those are like the two biggest matchup that change i yeah. also think that um like your lost box matchups are like significantly better with single strike because of tyranitar uh craig Lynch, and obviously being able to respond to dragonite easier and serena makes a really big difference yeah, yeah. And i think that people know that as well going into this tournament so i think that there's going to be um, an uptick in things like um ride on lost box um things like that so that's that's where i'm kind of like okay single strike actually has you know, like a really good chance of doing well if people are playing those you know decks expecting to focus on you know having a decent matchup um like into something like carlos lugia because carlos lugia is getting an insane amount of talk right now along with charizard whereas single strike isn't necessarily getting a whole lot of talk or honestly, the respect that it deserves. Um, so I think that um, the meta might actually shift to where single strike like, becomes a very viable play as well. Does um, Mew EX into Lost Zone Turbo or Giratina make sense to counter the single strike and Charizard? I think it's just a prize trade. I don't think it necessarily like completely counters them. Um, I just think it kind of accelerates the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, Good as well, a finisher against uh, Tina. Are are you saying Mew EX in those decks against? I mean, into those decks, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think Mew EX is kind of hard to include or justify the inclusion in the in like in Mirage Gate decks, but I think there is definitely some. There's definitely some plays uh, where it, it can come up. Okay, well, good segue there. Which decks shouldn't be playing Mew EX into this tournament? I don't think Gardevoir should. I think that's the first one. I don't think Gardevoir really needs it, but that's just my opinion. Like, I think that if you go up against Garatina, um, you still have um, pretty good routes um, in like beating them with using your like early game. Um, Cresselia is still always good. The problem with Mew EX is that it's very easy to get one shot back. Um, so I think it's better used as a finisher in a lot of ways. But towards the end of the game, Gardevoir should already be used to finish. Like, you should have, like, a Shine Arcana or, like, a Zacian to finish the game anyways. Um, so I haven't necessarily liked Mew EX in that deck. I think the deck that should, like, always play it is probably Colorless Lugia. Um, but I don't think that Gardevoir, like, needs to play it. Because it's also such a bad um, starter. Because, like, one of the things that makes Gardevoir so powerful is that its first, like like, two to three turns, it doesn't necessarily need to have... Um, things like two prizes on the field so um because like those like first like two turns are just built on you know, developing your board state so i don't necessarily think that mu ex is something that you like have to have on that deck so that'd be the one deck where i'm like okay i don't necessarily think you need it i honestly i don't think mu ex is that bad of a starter in guardy because it has free retreat right so like if you need to hit uh the mirage step you can you don't have but to it's like, a two prize and that's the ha- argument yeah. I was having like, a two yeah, prize yeah. on your board is not great yeah, yeah. It helps you hit the Mirage step so much more consistent, though, I would say. Well, because there's also times where, like, you have to use um, Luminous Sign, or you have to just yeah. use, like, Forest Seal Stone occasionally. So, like, if you're starting with Mew EX and then you run into that situation, it just gets super bad. So that's that's kind of the reason as to why, like, I don't really want to be putting more than three two prizes in the deck, because you already have Zacian, and then, like, some people are playing um, the Luminion as well, uh, which I personally think the Luminion is good. So you're starting to add in more um, bad things that you don't want to start, you know, per se. So, yeah. Uh could be interesting if we see like uh people who play Mew EX and Guardi adding more collapse stadium because right now we only see like one but if we have two possibly it could make it more justifiable to play Mew. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could see that as well. And I have seen some lists recently like playing that two collapse. I'm not a, a big fan of two collapse, but I think if you're playing Zacian, Mew EX and Luminion, that's like a lot of two prizes you could be starting. So I think there is a more valid argument for two collapse in that situation. You could also play a penny over the collapsed if you're worried about Mawile in the deck. Yeah. And that's also another way to get stuff like Luminion or Mew EX off the board if you wanted to include those. It's also really good versus Lost Box as well. It's just like a very, very good card. Like when you Cresselia them and then if they have to cram you back, if you just like if you pull off the penny on the turn that they hit for 110, it, it just feels like you win. So yeah. Uh, another deck that I'm not like I'm not sure should play Mew EX is single strike Lugia. 
because that deck is big pretty tight on space. You have less colorless energy to work with. And um, you really don't need the extra damage from it quite as much as Colorless Lugia does, or the extra options, because you already can hit for a lot, a lot of stuff like Tyranitar. And it also has like less HP than Tyranitar, so it, it can be a little bit of a problem. I mean, there's definitely some situations it's still good in, like you could still copy Greninja. You could also still potentially copy Charizard EX, but like, I don't think the deck needs to play it, but I'm not 100% sure it's bad in the deck either. Okay, cool. So I want to kind of get into now just a meta prediction for Peoria. Um, but I'm going to kind of look back and get a high level overview of the past few major events. So we had Pittsburgh uh, several weeks ago now. Uh, obviously, Andrew Estrada took that down with Kyogre Lost Zone. Um, and, you know, really diverse uh, kind of top eight with Lugia, Chin Pao, Maridon, uh, Mew, VMAX in there. Um, and then. We had the uh, two regionals following that event, one in South America, one over in Barcelona. Uh, the South American tournament just turned into a Charizard fest with, I think, five Charizards in the top eight. Um, then Arceus, Umbreon, Garatina, Lasso, and Gardevoir. Um, and then over in Barcelona, this was more of a kind of Lasso geared top eight with three making up the top eight. Winner of the event was uh, with a Rapid Strike um, deck. Uh, the finals of that was Rapid Strike versus Gardevoir. So it kind of in the last three major events, um, the results have been all over the place. And I think that kind of, you know, is indicative of this meta where there's just, what, six, seven, eight viable decks that you could take to a tournament and, and do reasonably well with. So um, let's stick with the Pittsburgh results since that kind of um, is most relevant, I think, for our North American uh, events here. Do we how, how do we see the meta shaping up for this weekend? Is the hype around Lost Zone and Garatina going to hold up? And then the next two or three decks probably going to be Lugia, Maridon or uh you know Lugia um and Gardevoir or are the results from the other tournaments really going to shake us up where we're going to see a lot of people bring, bring Charizard or um a good number of people being bringing Rapid Strike how do y'all see kind of the top three most played decks in day one shaping up I think the Charizard result so I I don't necessarily think the Barcelona results are going to um, affect our metagame too much because there wasn't really anything surprising. Like, I wouldn't say that Rapid Strike Urshifu winning a major event is something that is super surprising. Um, but I would say that the Brazilian results definitely are. Um, I think that the fact that five of the top eight were like the same deck or like some variants of that deck was shocking um, to a lot of people. And I've seen the popularity of Charizard spike because if you actually look at the Pittsburgh results, Charizard did absolutely horrible. Like I think the best performing one was like in top 64. I don't think there were any in 32, any in 16. So I think that we, that we had a major tournament that showed that um, Charizard can do well when the metagame is right for it. I think I'm um, specifically a, a metagame where people are playing things like um, the Jesse Parker list of, um, Maridon when a single strike Lugia is also incredibly powerful. That kind of is the perfect metagame, I think, for Charizard to see success in. So I definitely do think that the Brazilian ones um, do matter a little bit more just because the results were so shocking. Um, whereas the Barcelona ones were, I wouldn't say like incredibly unexpected. Um, like there wasn't really anything like special. So I think that going into Peoria, Charizard will probably be the third or fourth most played deck. I could even um, see it being the second most played deck just because I think that um, people now have reason to play it. I think that's the thing. I think there's a lot of people that were trying to make it work. Um, I, for one, was trying to make the deck work, but I wasn't able to. But I think the um, Arvinzard list kind of solved a lot of the problems with that deck. So I do think that people now have a reason to play Charizard, and it should show up in a pretty um, solid showing up here. So, so you thinking the the Colrus version of that deck is the most viable? No, um, I think the Arvin one is the most viable one. Oh, um, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Arvin one can use the four seal stone. I think you get um the Pidgeot out a little bit more consistently on turn two. I think the Arceus is also kind of a liability as well because the thing that makes um Charizard such a powerful deck is that you oftentimes force them to hit through two or three of the um three hundred thirty uh, HP 
Charizards, whereas the Arceus variant, I, I was actually testing the Gardevoir matchup a lot, and they would just go boss the Arceus, boss the Pidgeot, and then they'd KO the Charizard. Whereas if you're playing the Pidgeot variant um, without the Arceus, you have less liabilities on the board, which I actually do think is really, really relevant. And I think that's a big reason. Um, and I do think it's easier to use four Seal Stone than it is to get Starbirth out, because I feel like that deck actually did sometimes struggle to get Starbirth out um on turn two consistently because you needed like so many um like other pieces along with that so yeah are you do you think the your top two would still be lost zone variant then lugia in terms of most played You're asking uh yeah uh i wouldn't even say lost i i mean lost box definitely is weaker right now um just because both of the lugia variants i think that single strike takes like a pretty favorable matchup in the lost box and i still do think that carlos takes probably a slightly favored matchup and since both of the lugia variants are going to probably split up at about seven to eight percent of the metagame each um i do think that with all that um i i would say that probably lost box wouldn't be something i'd be worrying about too much i would honestly expect there to be Lugia will probably be the most played deck, and I think the second one would be Gardevoir or Charizard, probably. But that's just, yeah, like, that's just my opinion. Maybe someone disagrees with me there, but... Well, I, I think if you combine the Lugia variants, then I think, yeah, that will probably be yeah. the most played deck. But I, I think you kind of have to split them up because there's, they, the way they play is so differently, and they have pretty different matchups, at least in, in terms of some of them. Uh, I I I think Tina will still stay at the most played deck, or well, lost on Tina, but I I'm not convinced it'll be by very much. Like I think all of the top six decks will be within one or two percent of each other, with Tina not probably having no more than fifteen percent, which usually we've been seeing the most played deck have closer to twenty these last few events. Yeah, it feels like the in Pittsburgh. There were about four or five decks that were within two percent, three percent of each other, so it was pretty tight. Uh, Andrew Owen, what do you? What do I you think Maridon will still be pretty high. Um, I don't. It might not be in the top two, but like it was third at Pittsburgh at over eleven percent, and then I think Color with Lugia is like one of its best matchups, especially if you're playing paths. Colorless Lugia really cannot deal with bravery charms that well is a big issue. Um, I mean, you can kill them with Weirder, but like uh, even if you put a V-Guard on Weirder, that doesn't work against Maridon, so they can just kill it back with a Maridon, and then they put a bravery charm on that, and you're like, how do I knock this out, right? Because Lugia really struggles if you get a couple of bravery charms in play, for sure, and also, obviously, you have the weakness against them. And also, you just pressure them so much turn one. Like, if you knock it, you can... Threaten knocking out a Lugia V turn one, even potentially bossing one turn one if they only have one in play. So, or obviously escape rope two is a, is another easier play. So I think that's a really good matchup for Maridon, and I think that people might look at that and want to play Maridon. Although Charizard EX is definitely a hard matchup, and I haven't tested that matchup very much, so I don't really know how bad it is. But it seems pretty difficult. But I don't think it will. I don't. I definitely don't think it will go down very much from where it was in Pittsburgh. So I think there's a decent chance it will be one of the most played decks. Owen, close, closing thoughts on? Yeah, I think just in decks. general, like most of the decks, like it's going to be a very diverse meta. Like you're going to hit a lot of different decks. You're not going to hit like a big clump. And we're going to see like, because of 151, it adds like more cards that make people want to play other decks. People always like playing new decks, no matter how good they are. So we're going to see like people, like from the last format, a lot of people want to play Tina. But after Pittsburgh, I would say a lot of people want to play Maridon. It's a really fun deck. It's really consistent. And also, I mean, people definitely want going to want to play Colorless Lugia. It's like one of the strongest decks, maybe even like the BDIF in this format. And it's it has the new card Mew EX, which everyone wants to play with right now. Yeah. And something y'all haven't mentioned at all, and it whenever people aren't talking about it, it seems like it sneaks back and dominates. Mew V Max. <laughs> what what is the metaphor uh shaping up for mu v max to to do this weekend i think part of the reason why mu obviously saw decent i mean good success at pittsburgh um even if it wasn't in high numbers was because charizard really i don't know i don't know if you can consider it underperforming but charizard 
did not have a very strong performance at all. So I'm sure many Mew players were able to go the whole tournament without hitting one. But I think in a format where Zard is a genuine threat, probably almost surely one of the top five decks, taking a abysmal matchup to Charizard seems like not the best idea. Yeah, like I played a game uh I think like yesterday where I was playing Charizard and I fell down like three prizes and I set up one Charizard and I won in two turns. Like the matchup is like pretty egregious. I actually think that like Mew V Max is probably not a terrible play for Sacramento. Um, because maybe we see tons of, you know, like anti Charizard decks and like that see lots of play like Lost on Giratina, which Mew actually does pretty decent against. But for Peoria, I would not play Mew V Max. I think that you're gonna hit I I would say it's probably fair to say like in a nine round tournament, you have a good shot of hitting like two Charizard. Like I think that's probably like fair. And that's just two matchups that you just really cannot win. I actually think that um DT Mu is better than Fusion Mu right now because the only way you beat Zard is just by breaking them completely. Uh, and DT Mu does have a higher chance of doing that, especially because like no one's really playing Spiritomb as well. Um, and I think that people aren't necessarily respecting Path as much this tournament, um, just because Path is not as strong as a card when everyone is playing like extra stadium cards or Pumpkaboo to beat that. So actually, I, I think the only way that you can play Mew this tournament would be the DT Mew with um, the brand new card um, Grabber, um, which takes a Pokemon from their hand and puts it on the bottom of their deck. I'm not saying it's good, but I'm saying that's, I think, the only way that you could make Mew viable for this event. Okay, cool. Um, now, since, you know, the conversation around Charizard is kind of coming to a consensus that it's going to be a highly played deck this weekend, um, a lot of top players gravitate towards Lost Zone since, or especially just Turbo Lost Zone since they've been playing it since it's come, it came out, they've done really well with it. Um, what changes would y'all make to Turbo Lost Zone to give it a better matchup against Charizard? Because it, it kind of seems like uh, if Charizard actually gets anything involved, you basically lose that game. So what would y'all do to improve the, the matchup there? Uh, I think there's like two realistic approaches that you can do to make that matchup better. I think first of all, like, this is not really an approach, but Turbo really needs Echoing Horn uh, to improve that matchup because a lot of the time uh, you'll be like one. If you KO two two prizers and four one prizers, which is not super realistic, but it definitely is accomplishable. It's way easier to do that if you could, if you have the Echoing Horn to take that one prize. Um, I have seen a lot of Turbo lists, not a lot, but a fair few, including Tropius or maybe Shaman V, just some sort of grass attacker to hit weakness against Charizard. I think Tropius is significantly better because uh, it's a one prizer that does a pretty sizable amount to Charizard. Um, but I'm still not convinced that Tropius necessarily makes the matchup that much better for Lost Wives. Yeah, so the problem with Tropius and Shaman is that Shaman gives up two prizes, which is like kind of annoying too, but um, Lost City is really, really annoying um, for a turbo to deal with because like, like when they Sableye, um, Charizard responds with Lost City, Iono, KO, and then they have to Sableye the next turn as well, and they only have one Sableye left in the deck, and if they do it again, then they just go Lost City, Iono them to like three or four and KO again. And at that point, then you've lost all your Sableye and it becomes like really, really rough. I personally think Tropius is probably um, the better card for the deck just because Tropius is really good um, versus single strike um, Lugia because you can one shot their Tyranitar and also Stonjourner, which are arguably the two hardest cards um, that Turbo struggles to deal with. Like Turbo just in general doesn't have a great um, answer to either of those cards, which then with the Tropius, you actually have, you know, somewhat of an answer to it but i would say that you could also try the halucha as well that's something that some people have been testing in lost box because it helps out versus um the mirror match it helps out versus mew a little bit as well and then also it helps out versus the charizard matchup because you can put 10 and 10 onto two charmanders and then go save like six six um and knock out two charmanders on the bench but um i and i don't necessarily think the matchup is that bad i think it's probably close um maybe even turbo lost box favored if it's built correctly but um, I would say by no means it's an easy matchup for either side. It 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 seems very 50-50 in my testing. Like I played um versus a couple lost box decks on my League Cup most recently. I got second place at, and um the lost cities were really, really difficult for them to handle. 
Um, and I would fall behind a couple of prizes early game, but then um, after like a couple Ionos and Lost Cities, they would kind of just like run out of good attackers and I'd kind of sweep them. So yeah, those are my thoughts on it. Were you playing Charizard tier caps? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I played Charizard similar to the list that got first place at um, Curitiba and the Lost Cities felt very, very good versus um, uh, the Lost Zone deck just in general. So yeah, the deck felt good. Yeah, I, I played almost the same list as Gabe and I only... Uh, I I only played against one loss box, but the only the main reason I lost was just because he was able to save by two Charmanders that both had 60 HP, and I wasn't able to like set up another serious attacker for the rest of the game. But if I could have evolved one of those Charmanders, or if they just had 70 HP, one would have survived, and I would have been able to set up another attacker and get further into the game. Yeah, I'm um, the 10 HP comes up so much, like. At the League Cup I was at this weekend, I think I had like three or four situations where I was like, dang, I really wish this was the 70 HP one Um, because the matchup I'd be playing against would be like 10 times easier. Um, Because like the the counter argument to that is like, oh, like what if they just use um something like the Halucha? Well, if you hit him with a hand disruption card, the only way they can actually use the Halucha is if they um just find it because uh, they can't actually nest ball for it. Um, so it's actually pretty difficult for them to pull off the um, Halucha play. So the 70 HP will come up more often than you think, just because it's so hard for them to Lucha. So yeah, that's also important to look at. I, th I think if I was playing Lost Box, I would consider making it more save life focused as well. Um, kind of like how Gabe said, you could play the Halucha and also um, play three save life potentially, because that also helps against Lost City. And that helps you use Sableye like more consistently over and over again. Because if you can get that off a few turns in the beginning without just like completely using all your resources, that can definitely help you in the matchup. So I think I would consider playing three Sableye if I was going to play Lost Box this week. Okay. Well, thank you for the uh, the free coaching. I've been testing nothing but Lost Zone for this weekend, and uh, I'm pretty locked in. So, um, okay. With that said, uh last kind of question i have for y'all for this weekend um what are your top two decks y'all are thinking about taking to peoria this weekend in order to win the tournament in order to go get that edg win we're not doing anything else here we're trying to get a win this weekend what are y'all bringing uh let's start off with owen uh it's a really hard question because i feel like there's so many good decks but i mean my number one deck has always been lugia Either single strike or colorless. I've been I've been testing both, mostly colorless because I know single strike really well. But I've been playing Lugia for a while. I've been playing it since it came out, and I feel like it's just like in a really good position. I love the matchups. Like a lot of decks, like for example Gardevoir, a lot of the matchups are 50 50. They're really stressful games. They go to time a lot. But with Lugia, I feel like uh, it's more dependent on what you hit. And no, like for me, I feel like I know the matchups really well. So. When I go into a game against Lost Box, I know how to play it really well. When I know, uh, when I go into a game against Lost Tina, I know how to play it really well. So, I think Luga is definitely my number one choice. Number two, probably have to go with Charizard. I really, I really like Charizard, just because of like, I mean, before I didn't like Charizard at all because I felt like it was really in inconsistent. You didn't set up turn one, you just lost. But after Kiritiba seeing the Arvin list, I feel like you set up really, really well. And once the deck sets up, it has. I feel like you just control the game. Like it's so hard for any deck in the format right now to one shot the Charizard and you just get to take knockout after knockout on small Pokemon. And even if there's big Pokemon, you can still chip. And there's like a lot of different lines you can take, especially with Pidgeot getting to take one card per turn. I just, I think it's really strong. Cool. Uh, we'll go Michael, then Andrew and finish with Gabe. Um, I think my two top picks are definitely Guardi and Colorless Lugia. Uh, I've been playing a lot of games with Guardi since Pittsburgh and a little bit before, and I just feel pretty comfortable with the deck. And I know that I have a decent chance of beating anything. And obviously, there are some matches like Maridon where they feel really favorable. Um, and the same thing that Owen said, Colorless Lugia for the most part has pretty good matches. There's a few unfavorables, but generally your matches are pretty good and i and i also think um either tina or lost box like some sort of loss on variant is a good additional backup but i, I am more focused on the, my top two pick um yeah i'm, I'm pretty similar to michael i've been playing i th I played the most lugia for sure i've been playing some colors so yeah i played a few games of single strike lugia as well 
Um, and I think one of those two deck, like one of the two versions of Lugia, is probably the deck I'm most likely to play. Um, I have seen a few. I've seen a few issues with both of those decks. So I'm not 100 percent sure about them. And I've also been considering Gardevoir a little bit, but have not put enough time into it. So if the if the tournament was tomorrow, I definitely would not be submitting Gardevoir. But I might put a little bit more time into it the next few days because I do like how it. I do like how some of its matchups look. So I think it could be a decent deck for the tournament as well. Um, my two options as of right now, or the top two picks that I have are currently Charizard EX. I think the deck is really, really strong, especially, um, a 15 round event. Um, Pidgeot is just a very, very good card, um, gives you a lot of stability that you need. You're able to set up pretty consistently throughout most games. I think if I were to, if I wasn't trying to win the event and I was trying to like top 32, um, then I would probably play Carlos Lugia. However, if I wanted to take a risk that could either blow up in my face or, um, ride me into top eight, I would consider a single strike because I think it's matchups versus some specific decks that I expect to see a lot of, like the Maradon matchup and like the Turbo and Tina matchup are just significantly better um, than Carlos's matchup for, um, versus those. So if I was thinking risky, I would probably consider playing single strike um, because I still think the deck is very good. But um, as of right now, I would just say like Lugia and Charizard are my top two options. I have, I have also looked into Turbo um, Lost Box with um, the Tropius um, and a couple of artisans as well so i can consistently get that back down in some situations where i need it like versus colorless or versus single strike lugia but um yeah those would kind of be my answers as of right now i think there's a lot of things that you can honestly take into this event you know because like in the past we've had like triangle metagames or square metagames now we have like 10 different decks that could show up and do well um so it's really difficult to prepare for an event when there's so many different decks to worry about so hopefully heading into Sacramento, we'll have a little bit of a better idea of what the metagame is, because right now it's pretty all over the place, because there really are like eight or nine decks that I think that could probably top eight this event, and I don't think that's really a controversial opinion right now. Yeah, and then uh, after Sacramento, San Antonio is going to be wild. We're going to have a crazy set come out in November for that tournament. LAFC but... as well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe LAFC. Toronto as well, right? No, no, Toronto's, no. Toronto's before. So. The first event of Paradox Rift is, I believe, LAC, and then we have Brisbane and um, Gdansk as well, and Poland, and which is the week after um, LAC, and then San Antonio is like the big first um, US American. event with that legal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Toronto cool. might be the biggest event all year. Yeah, it's like in Texas, San Antonio. So. You think it could be? Yeah, it would definitely be up there with like Orlando, just because. Dallas has always been huge, so we'll see if Orlando has to be the biggest. Bear. It was like well, but have, Orlando's not a, Orlando's not as cheap as it was last year. Wasn't Charlotte the biggest last year? No, it was or no, no, it, was, it, was, it, was it was Orlando. Orlando. Yeah, they had like fourteen hundred and fifty players. Over fifteen hundred, I think. Yeah, it was over fifteen. Oh, okay. Well, if they wanted to get over two thousand San Antonio, they could. Like that event space is huge. They could get. I, I think Indy is going to be pretty big. Yeah, yeah, that one will be big too. Well, because Peoria is going to beat be Pittsburgh, huge. right? I think that Peoria might be bigger than Pittsburgh. Or like it's going to be close because like it has, it has a really? two thousand registered in all all divisions. Yeah, what was yeah. Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh got? was like two thousand like two hundred or two thousand three hundred. Oh, then yeah, yeah, never mind. Pittsburgh will be bigger. Masters yeah. was like eighteen sixty before the round started. Um, I think it's just like so hard for people to fly to Peoria. So I think that's yeah. going to cause like a lot of like the West Coast people who like went to Pittsburgh are like, okay, I'm not going to do Peoria. <laughs> yeah, Peoria is yeah. definitely the hardest one to get to this year. Um, so affect its numbers uh okay reverse order real quick just any closing thoughts and if you want to show, shout out your coaching socials anything like that uh let's, let's close her out sorry sorry you gabe all right uh yeah shout out to draw gaming my sponsor appreciate all the support always over the past several months um pretty much smart tcg on all socials uh metify link will be in the description as well if you're looking for coaching uh, I will be at Peoria as well. So if you see me, come say hi. And yeah, no, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, you can go follow me on Twitter at Pokey Hawkeye. And yeah, I was glad to be on the podcast. Uh, excited for Peoria and still not sure my deck, but it should be a good <laughs> tournament. Uh, my Twitter is Alice Liverpool. Uh, thank you to DDG for having me and uh, excited to work with the team this year. Uh, my Twitter is Owen Dalgar, just my name. Uh, shout out to Ryan and DDG. And also shout out to Carson Washer, the latest DDG member. Yes, sir. Yep. Now it's two players last week, Michael Davison and Carson Washer. 
Um, and we have another announcement this week um, coming out tomorrow. So actually, by the time this video comes out, uh, the announcement will be out. So I'll go ahead and say we we are venturing into the BGC realm of Pokemon uh, and are signing two really good players on the BGC side. Um, so big things happening for Dead Draw Gaming for, you know, my goal is to definitely get into as many of the different areas of the Pokemon esports realm as we possibly can. And this is just the next step. Um, so yeah, uh, go check out deadrawgaming.com. Um, all of our socials are Dead Draw Gaming on, on Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, everywhere. Um, also be sure to go check out Cutter Tap. Uh, that's where we post all of the articles from our players. Uh, this week alone, we had articles from Jake Earhart, Michael Davison. Uh, we had shit. Who else do we have? You had Finn, uh, right? Finn had an article this week. Piper's got uh, one coming out um, tomorrow. So a lot of uh, content over there. If you want to check out um, all the articles from our great players, so uh all right with that thank you all so much and we will see you after peoria